Turning profits into professionals, our complicity in a corporatized art world paradigm. As usual, it was money that ruined everything. In the 1987 film, Wall Street, fictional character Gordon Gecko argued that, contrary to our antiquated notions of virtues and vices, that greed, for lack of a better word, was good. His phrase defined the beginning of a new era in our culture. Soon after, the profit-centered corporate paradigm simultaneously swallowed up both the art world and academia, professionalizing artistic practice in its wake. In the 1980s, the commodification of art ramped up. The once small art universe exploded when art became an asset class in an unregulated marketplace, sparking the growth of mega galleries, art fairs, and art stars. Art objects became trophies, money laundering vehicles, and an excuse to attend exclusive parties around the world. The old artists who had paid their dues were suddenly sidelined as an investment mentality of getting in on the ground floor drove speculative buying of young artists' work. Fledglings were plucked from art schools and fed into an ecosystem of collectors, galleries, curators, and eventually auction houses, an arrangement that would produce money for all involved. Up until this time, the traditional artist trajectory was that after a few years of undefined study, artists would get some kind of a day job to survive and spend as much time as possible in the studio. They'd put in a decade or two of sustained work to develop their voice and ripen into seasoned, respected artists who might eventually get their due. Because many artists stopped making work after a few years, this system was a litmus test. If despite few rewards, the players remained in it for the long haul, they were the real deal. But the demands of this ramped up art world created a new mythical career dream for artists. Start with a BFA, followed by a sold out MFA show, gallery representation, and maybe even the Whitney Biennial all before one's 30th birthday. Some of the artists considered most successful in this new system spent their time designing work to be produced by studio assistants, overseeing licensing, and above all, maintaining their brand. Now we had CEO artists producing work for CEO collectors. Contemporary art auction prices and newspaper headlines dangled the art profession as a suddenly viable way to fame and fortune. At the same time, similar changes were taking place in academia, professionalizing BFA and MFA degrees. In the generation before mine, artists could come from anywhere. Being exhibited and picked up by a gallery was simply about the work. Few artists had degrees. The credentials of my professors were studied with Hans Hoffman or went to Black Mountain for a few years. When I was an undergraduate in the 1980s, teaching art was an enigmatic process compared to other disciplines. Universities would just give our departments a few buildings on the edge of campus and leave them to their own mysterious devices when it came to educating students. Our focus was solely on learning skills, developing a voice and strengthening the work. We learned about art, artists and ideas, but never even heard the term art market. As a result, I wasn't sure what I would do post BFA, but unlike today's graduates, I never felt misled, not even implicitly about what I was preparing myself for. Professional practice courses only became de rigueur during the corporatization of higher education. Businessmen who had never taught a day in their lives replaced academics in governing bodies of universities. Students were now consumers. The traditional ideals of fostering critical independent thought, producing democratically engaged citizens and pushing boundaries of perceived limitations were replaced by the desire to produce me measurable results and guaranteed value for customers while maximizing profits for the institution. As a result, we shifted from educating artists to producing our professionals. In order to pay the high salaries of additional administrators, cater to customer desires for better campus amenities and follow a luxury goods marketing philosophy, tuition had to go up. 
if the top art schools are going to charge 50,000 a year, parents want to see return on that investment. So selling students the mythical art career dream and arming them with the tools to get a leg up on the competition to realize that dream became a part of our job description. The fact that only one in several thousand will get that New York gallery is an inconvenient truth that's better left out. Instead, we capitalize on their youthful optimism because let's face it, each individual student thinks that they are going to be the exception. University art programs progressively transformed from deep wide philosophy-based education or renegades teaching radical thought into just another safe homogenized part of a giant institutional machine. With a goal of standardizing protocol and systems across departments for ease of management, with no differentiation between art and engineering, we're all simply producing productive new members of the capitalist economy. Never mind that this corporate paradigm with its attendant paperwork and hoops to be jumped through has the potential to leave behind some of our best right brain heavy artists and teachers. Would Van Gogh be able to complete a grant budget form? What would iconic art educator Robert Henry tell his dean to do with that mandatory university wide outcome based assessment? Nevertheless, we professors did our jobs, arming students with information about the art world. We taught them how the system is supposed to work with a sequence of required steps. Now, in their minds, the trajectory would go something like this. Well, I'll get a BFA, then an MFA, I'll get a few galleries to start selling my work and maybe teach, but you know, only if I have to. Now, regarding professional practice courses, information is never a bad thing. I'm not suggesting we revert to the days when students were kept in the dark, only that we might have overcompensated, swinging the pendulum too far in this new market-driven direction. We're pushing them out the door to assimilate into an increasingly disempowering art world by producing a market-friendly, consistent body of work that fits into a neat, easily digested package, complete with artist statement containing the appropriate buzzwords. But before they even know who they are, before they even know what they would make sans the guidance of teachers and peers, like creating a constraining cover for a book that has not yet been written. Once the art world existed, it became the outcome-based model that we trained our young artists to fit into. The problem is that artists by nature aren't meant to fit in. Although various systems have now been established to disempower them and exploit their desire for success, artists are the leaders of the art world, not the followers. The system is built on their backs or more literally on their gifts. Since the beginning of recorded history, Artists have been described as shamans or prophets due to their extreme sensitivities and exceptional ways of viewing the world. And yet, when I recently asked my 3,500 closest Facebook friends how they would describe their relationship with the pre-pandemic art world, dysfunctional was the most common adjective used. There was a consistent dispiriting chasm between what they thought their art careers would be and their actual experiences. The word dysfunctional haunted me the way a newly revealed big truth often does. Yes, the art world operates like the most toxic of family relationships with generations of fabricated legends, conflicting public and private realities, broken promises, secrets, enablers, exploitation of the weak, gaslighting, no talk rules, and the ubiquitous fearful deference to the unchecked ones with the power to seemingly snuff out our existence with their disapproval. In a classic double bind, we artists can't discuss the reality of our experiences because we've been taught it will endanger our chances for success. Like if someone in the art world screws me over, I mustn't say anything or I'll be labeled a difficult artist. If I'm not successful, I must not be good enough so I'll pretend to be more successful than I am and my gallery will pretend to be more successful than it is and everyone else will do the same. 
and I'll be made to feel desperate as I endlessly seek validation from outside myself, but I can't look desperate. And of course, we must always appear to be producing. These are some of the absurd contortions we put ourselves through as we struggle perpetually to fight our way to the inside of a system that more often than not doesn't want us. Preparing students to naively walk into this kind of warped relationship is beginning to feel immoral and it needs to end. We can empower the next generation instead of trying to shoehorn them in to this existing structure. Pull back the curtain, expose the hall of mirrors, drop the games and personas that we've been taught to maintain and tell the truth about our experiences, disappointments and coping strategies. Tell your students what you wish someone had told you years ago. We're gonna teach you how the art world works and we'll be frank about your chances of earning a living that way. Think you're gonna be the 0.001% exception, go for it. But here's how some successful artists have done it on their own outside the gallery system. We'll share other ways to make a living with your skills. The Etsy shop, licensing, traveling around the US in a van doing art fairs, the public art route, production work, the niche markets. We'll also tell you about the artists who are nurses, psychologists, curators, graphic designers, and carpenters to pay their bills, freeing them to make the work that they want to make with no compromises. There's a long history of this and no shame in doing so. And it does not make you less of a real artist. The art world owes you nothing, even if you have talent, work hard, or do all the right things. The art world is not a meritocracy. There are no extra points for effort, earnestness, dedication, or sacrifice. And unless you've got fantastic connections, after you do the basics, a great deal depends upon luck. There are distinct and often opposing agendas at play between the freedom you need to evolve and grow your most powerful work and the system based on that work's commodification. If you fail to understand and accept this, you risk a perpetual drifting back and forth between two opposing value systems and living with a cognitive dissonance that you may never resolve. You can easily spend your entire life awaiting validation, suspended in an eternal love-hate relationship with the vocation you've chosen, feeling unworthy and wondering why it isn't working when you have supposedly done everything right. Here's my stock of rejection letters. Here's my average yearly list of art income and expenses. I made a profit solely from my work this many years and all these other years I took a loss. This is how I negotiate expenses for my art making addiction with my spouse. This is the dream farmhouse I could be living in now if I didn't invest fifteen dollars to $20,000 a year into my art career, thinking it would pay off one day. Here is how I got through the really lean years. Let's go on a field trip, shall we? To visit an older artist and see where they store decades of unsold art. If you're lucky, you won't need to rent an extra storage unit with rent that increases each year. Many of the artists you admire are likely making sacrifices that you might not be willing to make. Many who appear to support themselves with their work are in reality partially or fully supported by spouses, family money, or jobs that they don't talk about because... And while we're at it, full-time teaching jobs are as rare as rhinos, part-time teaching pays below poverty level wages with no benefits, your college exploits this labor through their use of adjuncts, and it may take you the rest of your life to pay back your predatory student loans. So, because I care about you, I am not going to set you up to feel like a failure if you don't achieve a dream that few artists have ever actually achieved, myself included. But I will tell you about a dream that many artists live quite happily. In it, you may actually reach some of these steps, but instead of being focused on ascending the mythical art dream ladder, let's talk about building your art life. 
It's more like a circle, one that expands exponentially as the years pass. You work, you find your voice, you feed it with books and films, experiences, and an ever-growing creative community. You take risks, push your work, follow your intuition, search for opportunity, build on successes, and advocate for your work. There will be highs and lows. Sometimes there will be money, validation, or press. If you're lucky enough to catch a wave, ride it and understand that while it may widen your circle, it won't last forever. The art life is a way of being in the world rather than a seemingly impermeable system you're endlessly fighting to gain access to. It's a vocation, not just a career. In the art life, we're part of a creative tribe that exists through time and space. The objects we make enter us into larger conversations in dialogue with those who lived thousands of years ago and those who haven't yet been born. We work to heal ourselves and in the process heal others. Our vision is vital to revealing where we are as a culture and our gifts move civilization forward. Our sole responsibility is to make the best work that we can. William Burroughs famously advised Patti Smith, build a good name, keep your name clean, don't make compromises, don't worry about making a bunch of money or being successful. Be concerned with doing good work and make the right choices and protect your work. And if you build a good name, eventually that name will be its own currency. Keeping the focus on your currency allows you to navigate successes and failures within the art world. Ironically, you'll notice that being focused on the work rather than the prize is much more likely to bring that prize to your door. Your desire for a position in the art world above all else can pull you away from the quest to find your truest, strongest voice. And the outside world needs the voices of artists right now more than ever. Because artists are the final holdouts. Virtually every profession has been driven by capitalism towards corporatization and corporations with their standardizing of process, building consensus, obfuscation, and aversion to risk, they're the enemy of art. We are one of the last influences upon our culture that is not owned and run by a board of directors. And that's why it's frightening to hear freshman art students talk about branding because if the artists give up, that's it. There's no one else left. There have to be free voices in our society that have no agenda beyond telling the truth. It's what our fellow citizens have relied upon us to do since the beginning of time. Please, they ask us, you're free, so say what I can't say. If we as artists throw away our power, being seduced into a corporate mentality so we can simply make our product and get our piece of the pie like everyone else, then we not only undermine our own voices, we deprive the world of our unique and necessary gifts. Artists possess the power to expose what's going on beneath the surface, initiate difficult conversations, and help people process an increasingly complex world. We see things more clearly precisely because we're on the outside. We chronicle the essence of our times for future generations. We foster empathy, pointing out our common humanity, we stand in the fire giving others the courage to do the same. We remind people that they don't have to go along with this. There are other ways to live. We show the world that the antidote to unbridled capitalism and rampant corporatization is meaning. No one knows what our post-pandemic reality will look like, but we do know that this upheaval presents potent possibilities for a new previously unimagined paradigm. What if our goal as teachers was to have the next generation of artists emerge informed, clear-eyed, grounded in reality and empowered like never before? Armed with the truth, they might just forge a new future for all of us. Thank you. <laughs>